this work. Great. Thank you very much for having me here today. In the early 19th century, America was a hotbed for criminal justice reform. Just off the high of the American Revolution, America was trying to shove off some of what it believed to be the worst parts of the British justice system. To them at the time, it was the punitive nature of criminal justice in Britain. Therefore, reformers at the time wanted to create a more rehabilitative or reformative system as opposed to merely punishing. So what people did at the time was that they proposed a new jail system called the penitentiary. Opened in 1829, this is Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was the first penitentiary ever created in the world. And the idea was, is that if you could create a particular environment to improve the time people spent incarcerated, then they could leave incarceration by being better people. Now, how did they do that? They essentially institutionalized solitary confinement. This is an example of the room. Everyone was housed alone. Through that gate there is a courtyard with extremely tall walls so you could only see the sky. Now why would they do that? It's because if they believed, if they isolated people to keep them away from the moral contagion of other inmates, then they'd have no choice but to commune with God. And through communing with God, they would then become penitent. Thus, how we got the penitentiary. The problem is, is that at least in 2011, the UN would have called this system torture by its very nature and would call for its abolition worldwide. At the time, in 1829, it was considered a huge win for human rights across the country. However, even at the time, we don't need to transpose our current morality on a different era. People that toured the facility uh, saw the problems uh, that it was creating. Charles Dickens, who toured it shortly after it opened, said, in its intention, I'm well convinced that it is kind, humane, and meant for reformation. But I'm persuaded that those who designed the system of prison discipline and those benevolent gentlemen who carry it into execution do not know what it is that they are doing. Regardless of criticisms like this, uh, not only did it win out as the prominent model for jails within the United States for the next century, but it was replicated over 300 times throughout the world on every continent except for Antarctica. Now why start a conversation at a 21st century tech conference about a 19th century jail system that has since gone away? It's because our moment is not much different than the moment they had here in the early 1800s. In fact, if we just take of prison discipline out of this quote, this very much applies to the discussions that we're having today around the use of artificial intelligence in the criminal justice system. However, I'd say that the big difference is that instead of trying to push criminal justice towards God, today we're trying to push it towards science. And to be clear, this isn't a talk about how AI is going to ruin justice and that we can't have AI work in a fair manner. Just in the same way in the 19th century, I wouldn't argue for the abolition of prisons. But what I am trying to point out today is that the use of artificial intelligence in criminal justice systems, as opposed to other systems, creates unique human rights, rule of law issues that are not only going to affect the individuals within the system itself, but also the adaption of these tools going forward. So let's talk about where AI is within the criminal justice system. These are just five examples of fairly prominent uses, and they come in two major forms, as far as my interpretation is concerned. One is improving police and state investigation. The other is towards reforming the way that the system functions itself. In that first category, you have facial recognition, data extraction, and probabilistic genotyping. Facial recognition you're all very aware of, uh, and I don't need to spend any time with it here. Uh, mobile data extraction, uh, for those that don't know, is an algorithmic way to circumvent encryption and passwords on mobile and digital devices uh, that uh, can crack even the most recent versions of the iPhone. Uh, probabilistic genotyping is used uh, to compare DNA results when your DNA sample is not of high enough quality to use traditional uh, comparison models. It, in fact, it creates a likelihood ratio between a sample and an individual. On the reform side, we have predictive policing, and this usually comes in one of two forms. One, either an algorithm is created uh, to be optimized for a particular purpose that is either leading uh, police departments to help improve 
prove where they send police officers to try to dissuade people from committing crime or to determine who deserves more police officer attention. Both have uh, significant uh, problems with that. But for the sake of time and focus today, I want to focus on risk assessments, which we heard actually a little bit, the slide about Compass in the previous conversation uh, is, is an example of what I'll be talking about today. So at a cybersecurity context, uh, conference, everyone knows what a risk assessment is. To put it within context within the criminal justice system, there are three main outputs that are being used uh, in this situation. One is what the likelihood someone is going to show up to their court hearing. Two is if they're going to commit a crime in the future. And three, if they're going to commit a violent crime in the future. These outputs are being used in parole, sentencing, and pretrial detention decisions. A pretrial detention hearing is that period between arrest but before trial, so the individual actually hasn't been found guilty of anything yet, but yet we have an algorithm informing judges that they might want to commit an, a crime in the future and therefore you should incarcerate them and take away their liberty interests as the state determines whether or not in fact they are guilty of a crime. These tools have a plethora of issues involved with them, but today I wanted to focus on three. The first being data and bias, and then transparency and explainability, and then last, framing. There is a structural problem in the way that these tools are built. Obviously, AI and machine learning are extremely data hungry, but there is no such thing as a crime data set. It simply does not exist. I don't care what country you're in. Even with all of the data collection China can do, they do not have a holistic, complete crime data set. And why is that? It's because, at least if you look at places like the US, 50% of all crime goes unreported. If crime goes unreported, then a machine cannot know that it occurred because it will not be reflected in the data set. The data that we do have is terribly not objective. Because one, it's not a crime data set. What it is, it's a data set of policing habits. And this creates all sorts of particular issues. First, these are all human decisions, right? This is why we have data within the criminal justice system. Decisions on where police go to police. Oftentimes, they're in poor or minority communities that receive the most over-policing, beginning to skew the particular data set. In the United States, there are plenty of studies that show that drug use among white and black residents is in fact the same, yet you'll see black people be arrested upwards of 70% more for drug offenses than white counterparts. Who reports crime also affects this issue. If you live in a country where there is an immigration crackdown, which I may, then you can assume that the immigrant population, even if they have a legitimate reason to call the police, is simply not going to do that. In fact, police chiefs in places like Los Angeles, Houston, and Dallas, which have large Hispanic populations, have noticed a decrease in calls from the Hispanic community since President Trump came to office. This affects the data set. What gets attention also affects the data set. In most countries, and especially in America, domestic violence and rape are not, one, reported on as often as they occur, but two, are not followed up with by law enforcement even if they are reported on. Again, this affects the objectivity of the data set. And then lastly, we get into issues of subjective charging. These all create the issues of bias and his of reflecting historic trends that we heard from the last speaker. But even acknowledging this particular, these particular data issues, even if you create an accurate algorithm, it is in fact not guaranteed to be legal. Take gender, for example. If you're a statistician, you're going to want to use gender as one of your input factors because men disproportionately commit more crime and more violent crime than women do. However, in democratic and pluralistic societies, we tend to have this thing called equal protection where the state is not allowed to make a determination about an individual based on factors like gender, race, and religion. So here's a case where what science may tell us is a good impact factor, the law is going to say you cannot use. But that's an obvious example. What about zip codes in segregated communities, where one zip code may indicate that someone is white and another zip code may indicate someone is black? Is using that as a proxy going to uh, stand legal scrutiny? It is not uh, clear at this time. Or take, for example, something that is being done currently within the United States, we're asking the question of whether or not the defendant that is being questioned by the risk assessment has a family member that has ever been incarcerated. That machine learning would tell us, would give us a good idea of whether or not that person is likely to commit a crime themselves. 
And that sounds like a very fair input factor to use. But in the United States, if you dig a little deeper, you realize that for white children, one in 57 of them will have a parent that has been incarcerated at some time. For black children, the number is one in nine. Criminal trials are meant to be open. The algorithms need to be as well. I will not spend a lot of time on this as we heard it from the last speaker, but transparency and explainability of both the algorithm and the training data behind them is going to be critical to determine whether or not these tools are in fact just and fair. However, currently we see a push as private companies are developing these tools of them hiding behind trade secret privilege so that courts and defendants cannot see the data and the algorithms themselves. And this is going to be the way that we find out whether or not these tools are in fact uh, doing what it is that they are going to do. With the last few minutes I have though, I want to focus on an issue that's not brought up as much in the discussion around AI and criminal justice. And that's about the issue of framing. And what I mean by that is in the same way that Google search is normative in the way that we intake information, about one third of people that use Google search only click on the first result and forget the rest. These tools similarly have a power to package information in a way that is determinative of outcomes. And this is something that we need to continue to audit and pay attention to. To dive into this issue further with my colleague Keith Porcaro at Georgetown University, we developed a, a simulation called Detain Release. We joke that it's like Tinder for bail, but this is what it is. Essentially, it puts the user in the seat of a district judge that has to determine whether or not an individual should be detained or they should be released. Uh, they are served these defendant cards that give you the information of the individual, what they're charged with, and a risk assessment. We have a version of this where we can serve it without risk assessments as well. Here you can see in that last slide where um, if someone is released back into the community, there is a statistical chance that they either won't show up for court or that they will be arrested again for another crime. And that affects the outcome of the simulation. If for anyone that is interested in this, detainrelease.com, we've opened it up for public beta and feedback. So this has become a very useful tool to teach our students about risk assessments, about bail, and about pretrial detention. But it's also given us a unique insight that we didn't have before. As our students are playing the game, we're doing a live data capture of the choices that they're making. One, and this isn't reflected in the data here, is that when we take our students from defendants without risk assessments to defendants with risk assessments, we see them become much more conservative and begin to detain more people as they're being nudged by the risk assessment. But perhaps even more startling, as you can see in the bottom row, uh, the t middle and farthest right, that when detention rates, or when the risk assessment says that the likelihood of a new crime or a new violent crime is high, it's almost dispositive of the outcome of what is going to affect that particular defendant. And that should be startling. What's further interesting and can't be reflected here is that these tools influence decision making in ways that data doesn't make obvious. In one example, we had a group of students going through the simulation and they had, on a couple of occasions, two or three women that reoffended after they were released. So that particular group vocally told us that they were going to self-correct for a broken algorithm and just detain all the women that came across their screens. Dickens and others knew the harms of Eastern State Penitentiary back when it was open. However, the facility itself ran that systemic isolation until 1913. And they didn't correct it because morality and human rights had changed. They corrected it because they had become overcrowded and underfunded. When it comes to AI and the criminal justice system, we cannot fumble our way forward in the same way that Eastern State Penitentiary did. These issues of data, transparency, and framing are known. The solutions and ways to audit them are obvious. A failure to heed these issues now is going to leave many of us seeking penitence later. Thank you.